I just went away for a second, but now I'm back. Hey guys, how are you doing? <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Great. Hello, foodies. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. So my name is Abyssinia. I'm your host for today. We are back again with another segment within Food for Foodies. So Food for Foodies is basically an educational webinar. We're here to provide information to hospitality professionals or just a hobbyist who, who would like to take their career or their hobby to the next level. So if you would also like some recipes or some creative lifestyle tips or life hacks, go over to foodforfoodies.co because we are also a blog. So I would like to welcome Kiana and Chanel with us today. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Hello everyone. So Chanel is the owner of My Fabulous Food, a culinary company that mm -hmm. offers food styling, food photography. She also has her own seasoning line and she does recipe development. So thanks for joining us, Chanel. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And then we have Kiana here. She is native of Virgin Islands. Woo -woo. <laughs> yeah. Residents, California native. <laughs> Residents, sorry. So she's on the island right now joining us, and she focuses on she has she is the owner of a successful commercial and wedding company. So she does food styling as well as food photography and she makes amazing food. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. So today we're basically going to try to get a little bit in depth on what you need to know to start your food photography business, how to make it successful, how to make it profitable, how to take proper pictures best lighting practices, equipment, and all that good stuff. So you guys are in for a treat. And we're gonna get started. So what would you guys like to start with? Since you're the professionals, I'm here to learn. I'm really excited to dive in with you guys and learn as much as I can. Well, I think that the best place to start when you're considering going into food photography, even as a hobbyist or a professional is considering your why. Um, when you are looking at the world of food photography, there are a lot of voices and you want to express your own originality. You want to express what you have to offer and what you like to cook. And for you know somebody who is looking to do it more professionally or to assist in their businesses, it's, you know, Maybe you have a menu you want to feature and you want to get better and shoot the menu properly, or you are a blogger and you want to improve, or you just really love cooking and you want to provide inspiration. There's a number of reasons to get started. So once you hone in on that, I think that that's a good place to start. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. I just want to take it a, st a few steps back because I know I gave you ladies a quick intro, but I do want you to have a chance to share a little bit about yourselves to the audience before we get started. Okay. So I'll start. Um, once again, my name is Chanel Murphy. I am the owner of My Fabulous Food. I started blogging and catering at the same time around 2015. So with the blogging aspect, I wanted to take my own food pictures. I love art. I love creating. So a lot of it came naturally. Um, but over the years, I really just practiced and got to the point where I started the food photography business. And I've had other you know, food companies reach out to me to take their pictures as well. So that's where I'm at. Um, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Well, one question for you, how long did it take from the point you started to the point where businesses were reaching out to you to take their pictures? Um, maybe a couple of years. I mean, my for, oh, like a year. So in 2016, Essence actually reached out to me to do some recipe development and photography for the website. Wow. And I've worked with them over the years a few times, so. I would say that was major because they, they actually hit me up on Instagram. So Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, yeah it started soon after, so it didn't take too long. Okay. There's some hope for me. <laughs> 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 
Um, I'm Kiana Adams, and I am a freelance photographer. I've been shooting professionally for, gosh, about 16 years. Um, I went to undergrad and focused on uh, studio art with a concentration in photography. And shortly after graduating, like two years after, I ended up moving to the Virgin Islands and um, started working professionally as a photographer and uh, started my business not too long after moving here and went into weddings and then expanded into commercial. Um, you know, when you shoot weddings, you pretty much have to wear many hats. You have your portrait photographer, you're an architectural photographer, you're a food photographer, you're an event photographer, you're a product photographer. I mean, you do everything. And so you really get to taste a lot of the different areas of that industry. Um, so as I went through, um, I really, I would call myself the secret, not so secret food photographer and I'd express my passion for that. And it was about a year ago, um, uh, probably about April of last year, I decided to take the plunge and delve into it. Um, I still run my freelance, but food is a place that I find I can just really be creative. It's, um, it's different than my client work. It's, I take a more artistic expression and energy behind that. And so, you know, I really go in and, you know, try to dissect, dissect um, how things work, the imagery, because it's very different than photographing people. Awesome, we have a hey. Yeah, that's my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. <laughs> so um, let's get back into it. So you said it's about finding where you want to start, figuring out where you want to start. Is that it when you get to get into food photography? Yeah, I think with, when you jump into any um, profession and especially something very niche, you really, it is important to understand why you're doing it, where you want to go, what your intention is. I'm really big on setting intentions for anything that you do, and especially with regard to business or things that are creative. Um, so I think figuring that out and then, um, you know, doing some research and exploring. When I first got into really taking food photography seriously, uh, Instagram is, I mean, you know, once you start plugging in food as into their algorithm, I mean, it unleashes a whole, <laughs> a whole world. A whole yeah. world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, you see what's out there um, and you see the types of images that you personally respond to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you kind of just explore. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you kind of get a, an idea of, okay, well, what do I have to say? You know, what's my feel? Um, you know, and then that goes into a whole branding exercise. But you know, you 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 go you go from there. That's a place to start. Okay. So how do you go about whether I'm a beginner or medium level photographer? How do you go about improving your skills? So, as with anything, research. Um, you know, for me, as coming from the world of photography the leap wasn't so far, although food is a completely you know, different beast altogether. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're getting started, I remember one of the things that I thought is, you know, it was kind of like this self-doubt, like, I can't do this, you know, I need a chef to prepare these meals. I need somebody who is really proficient in this area to help me, you know, and it was a lot of self-talk. Um, because I had everything that I needed. And that's one thing that I would impart to anybody who's wanting to get started is start at home. You have, if you're cooking, you're an avid, um, you know, person in the kitchen, you probably have everything that you need to get started. And the little bit that will enhance it, you can get along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of everything that you need to enhance your photos, <laughs> what would that consist of? Um, so camera, um, that's a big one. And 
there's a saying, um, you know, the best camera is the one that you have on you. So if you have a DSLR, use that. If you have an iPhone or an Android or a point and shoot, start with that. And then, you know, think about, um, after you think about camera, then you think about surfaces. When you do a lot of research into food photography, you see that there is a certain, um, there's certain types of setups that work and certain types of setups that don't work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if food is the focus and food is the subject, then you want to really think about the surface that you lay it on. Mm -hmm. And so you're creating essentially a vignette um, and telling a story of what you know, you want to say about a particular dish. So, you know, you have your iPhone, you pick your surfaces and surfaces are, you know, if you're starting and you have, say you have a really awesome um, picnic table outside that's wood and it's rustic, that's a great surface. Um, you have, I remember one of the first shoots that I did with food and this was years ago for a skincare line, was going to Home Depot and using wood tiles. I mean, they had the look and the, the texture and the finish of wood. You can put them together as big or as small as you'd like. And you set the food on there and it, it looks pretty amazing. And in a photograph, you really are not able to tell that it's a ceramic tile mm -hmm. or real wood. Okay. What? You were gonna say something to know? I was gonna ask you guys. Um, I was gonna ask the two of you ladies what cameras you use. Oh, what cameras we use. So I have, I had a series of cameras. So I started out actually with the starter camera. Um, it was a Canon Rebel T6. So this is a very like, this is a beginner camera. I don't use this anymore, but it is like relatively inexpensive for a DSLR if you're just starting out. Um, now I have a Fujifilm X-T2. It is a mirrorless camera, so I really like it. It's lightweight, and then for shooting manually, the knobs are very user-friendly um, mm -hmm. for how to shoot manually. Um, so what is mirror? What does it mean for it to be a mirrorless camera? I know that we can easily go on Google and figure that out. I <laughs> actually do it before, but... part of it, honestly, I cannot explain in detail. All I know is that it's lighter, it's lighter weight. And for me, this particular camera, like I can shoot easier manually with it because mm -hmm. all the barrels are like, you know, I can see them on top, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's. So I, um, I shoot with a uh, Canon Mark IV um, and it is, it has a mirror in the camera. And so essentially, you know, the image is reflected on the mirror and then you know that's how you receive the image whereas with the mirrorless camera it's the image is being produced digitally and the mirrorless cameras that they're coming out with now are phenomenal um so it's really just depending on your preference okay. and um you know i know a lot of um my photographer colleagues uh, they have mirrorless cameras that they like to travel with, but they also shoot portraits and things with them as well. So, you know, if you, you research it, you can see what your preference is and, and what you might prefer for your particular style. Okay. And then if I'm a beginner just starting off and I just have my iPhone, do you guys have any tips for, for working? You use your iPhone. I mean, the iPhone, especially the iPhone 11, I, I can't, I know Androids take really beautiful pictures as far as I can see, um, mm -hmm. but use your iPhone. You can, um, there are apps that specifically work with uh, smart devices that can give you really awesome picture quality because a lot, the second half of the work is in the editing. So, you know, you do your composition, you have everything set up just right, you get your shot, but then you have to still go and edit. And that's where the other part of the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So I do have another question for you guys. I want to tell everyone who's watching, please do comment and feel free to interact with us because we are here to answer you guys' questions. We will get to as many questions as we can in the next 40 minutes because unfortunately we only have an hour. 
Yeah. Um, but what do you guys use for editing software? So for editing software, I use Lightroom. Um, I have it on my desktop. So I love you use Lightroom too? Yeah. Yeah, I love Lightroom. Yeah, and if you're shooting with your iPhone, there's also Lightroom Mobile. So that's really handy as well if you're taking pictures with your iPhone. So. And Lightroom Mobile, I love because I think there was a really big disconnect between getting your photos off of your computer and getting them onto social media platforms or Instagram specifically where you have to really use a mobile device to, to you know, do it. Um, but Lightroom Mobile has, I mean, it's been awesome. Um, you know, there is a bit of a learning curve and if you uh, are willing to research that and really get and delve into it, um, the desktop is not, I mean, the same features that are on the desktop are on the mobile application. So, you know, once you get that down, it'll be really cool and it'll be to your advantage to get to know. Um, another very user-friendly application for editing your photos would be Snapseed by Google, which I really, really, really enjoy. Um, it's just quick and easy because Sometimes, you know, if you're a creative and you're posting, you go through this sort of analysis paralysis, as my husband likes to call it, and you're overthinking and, you know, trying to figure out what to post. And if you have your images on your phone, whether you're importing them from Dropbox or another, you know, application like that, or they're even in your, um, your actual photos on your phone, you can import them into Snapseed and you've got all the tools there. You can light, you can shade, you can use filters, you can clone, heal, you can do all of it. And it's really, really, really user friendly. And I think that it's free. So that's another one to really think about using. We do have a few questions. We have a question from Lauren. She's asking, what is the advantage of using a mirrorless versus mirror camera? Um, that's weird. <laughs> so, a mirrorless versus DSLR. If you, so what I did is I actually Googled it and they had a lot of different comparisons. So honestly, I would just do research and then you can kind of, you know, test it out, see what your preference is. But one major thing is that my mirrorless camera is a lot more lightweight and just the Fuji I like particular, in particular because of where the dowels are located. But my images come out really sharp with that camera and yeah, I love it. Right, and I think that that's one of the, that is the big advantage is the clarity of imagery and what you're getting. Um, you know, I have, limited experience with mirrorless cameras. I my camera has a mirror in it. Um, so you know that's what I learned on. That's what I prefer. And you know, until that changes, uh, I really can't speak to the advantages of mirrorless because I haven't researched it personally. We do have another question. So Victoria is asking, she's a food stylist. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Victoria. She prefers natural sunlight versus studio lighting, although she does think both have their place. So what are you guys' thoughts on both? Which one do you guys prefer? I, 90% of my photographs are in natural lighting. I love natural lighting. I like the, I like cloudy days. Um, it gives my pictures like a cohesive look. Um, and you have like a natural, I don't know, natural glow from the sun. Like studio lighting is still something I'm personally learning and experimenting with. So that's a whole nother beast, but I prefer natural light. I love them both and they both have their place for me. Um, you know, I don't always have an opportunity to shoot during the daylight hours, even though I try. Um, but studio lighting, you can create that natural light look at any time of day and then have that consistency. I live in the Virgin Islands and right now it's cloudy today, but you know, you could have 
bright blazing sun and then cloud cover and then the light and the temperature of the light is constantly changing. And I think with studio lighting, you can get a consistency that if you are shooting um, a particular vignette or a setup and you want to have that same sort of tone and mood throughout the entire shoot, through multiple setups, then you have more control. You can control the light. For me, it's, it's a matter of timing. And, um, you know, to be quite honest, you know, if I feel like doing the full setup, I, um, I shoot in our family's kitchen. So, you know, it's my studio, but it's also a family space. So I, you know, if I had a dedicated studio, I would probably, do more studio lighting um, and I don't know, it'd be a mix and it just depends on the mood I'm in. You know, do I feel like setting it up or do I just feel like, you know, doing more manipulation to get the kind of, um, to shape the light the way that I want. So I, I hope that answers the question. I mean, it just really depends on, you know, how you want to shape the light and how consistent uh, your setup needs to be for what you're shooting. Mm -hmm. Could you guys walk us through the setup process from the present plate presentation to the equipment needed aside from the camera? Because I know we touched on that already. But the lighting, the backdrop, everything that you need to get the great to get a nice picture, and then all the way up to taking the shot. Sure. Um, so. For me, I, I like to plan out my shoots. Um, I have this little drawing software that, you know, my we all share our apps on our iPads, so my, it's something for my children. And I just take it and I just draw the setup that I want. It looks like a kindergartner did it, but you know, it's fine. And then it, it helps me plan out how I'm gonna fill and compose my shot before I actually cook anything, set anything up. Um, and then I know like what size plates and you know, I go through all of that. Um, I think, I don't know about for you, Chanel, but for me, uh, if you, you know, because shoots take the time that they take, most of the food that is being shot ends up like being cold. <laughs> So, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that, but, you know, by the time, and, and I don't do any manipulation to my, my food because I actually want to eat it when I'm done, even if I have to heat it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, it's, I find it's timing. It's a, it's a big game of timing. I have my lighting, I have my setup, my backdrop, all that, and then I get to cooking. And then, you know, figuring out like the plating and then getting it in the setup. And I just pretty much take a placeholder that was there, lift it up and put my plate or my pan or whatever it is down mm -hmm. and then have my camera already ready to, to shoot it. So yeah. okay. if I can just give my input, that's a great tip because I do it the complete opposite way. <laughs> I put everything first. And then, like, after it's done, I'm rushing to set up and then get the good picture before it gets too cold so I can eat it. Or if it gets cold, I'll just move out. But I do the setup after because I'm like, I don't really know. I don't know. I just never thought to do it the other way. But I'm definitely going to try that. Yeah. I think planning your shoots is really important. I mean, just take a piece of paper. And depending on what your Instagram or what your actual aspect ratio of your images are, draw it out. I mean, just draw it out and what it's going to look like. And if you see any dead spaces that need filled, filling, you know, decide what you're going to put there. And I mean, it's like I can, it, it looks crazy. Um, I can pull something up on my phone, but it's just like, you know, then you're ready to go. So my process is similar. Um, I do, I'll look at like a lot of inspiration first. So I'll get, I have Pinterest, like I love Pinterest. So I'll go in there and gather like inspiration for the mood I'm going for. And that kind of um, determines which backdrop I'm using, um, which color props I'm using. So I love like dark moody photography. I have a lot of like grays and browns and like 
darker backdrops. So I'll go from there and then I usually sketch it out as well. So I'll just do mine on paper, sketch out how I want my props to be, how I want like the fabric to flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, then I cook um, and then yeah, rush to plate it so that it's not cold. Yeah. And I usually plan my sheets to like a day, like days before. So I do it. I, I like shooting on cloudy days, like I said, <laughs> depending on the weather. So I literally will look at an app on my phone and then, you know, I'll plan my time that I'm going to shoot. And yeah, that's how I plan my shoots out. So. And one thing that I was going to say with regard to the natural light photography question is, you know, when you're shooting, you want to shoot as close to a large window as possible. You want to get your setup at, you know, close. If you're going, I mean, if it's super bright out, maybe you want to pull back just a little bit. But one thing, one tip or trick, if you don't want to buy a diffuser, which, you know, because I have been doing this for a long time, I have lots of diffusers of several different sizes. And a diffuser is pretty much this thing here. It is, this is one that I use for food. It's a five in one, it has a silver side. It has, you know, a white, a gold side, a white side and a black side, which, you know, you can DIY a lot of this. I mean, sometimes like if I'm in the middle of a shoot and I don't want to run to the other room to get my diffuser. I have a huge white cutting board and it acts as a fill, you know, just to add more light to a photo. But, you know, when you have one of those bright sunny days and you're looking for something cloudy, you can take a white bed sheet and hang it across or a sheer curtain and hang it across the window. Or if you are going to invest in a diffuser, you can use this and put it really close to your setup to create that sort of, um, you know, uh, cloudy day effect. Um, yeah, diffuser. Um, they're actually on Amazon. They're relatively inexpensive. So yeah. can, Amazon has a lot of photography props that you can go on and get for like low prices. So exactly. Yeah, exactly. We do have a question on that actually. Um, where do you get, where do you find your props? Oh, so, that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, so my props, um, I love shop. I go like different places for props. So you can look everywhere, anywhere from like Goodwill to find like vintage props. Mm -hmm. I love Etsy. Um, actually found some like vintage baskets off of Etsy recently. So I'm going to do something with that. Um, Crate and Barrel have great plates. They have great napkins and home goods. I actually absolutely love, love home goods. Yeah, that's my favorite store. So I go in there like once a well, prior to quarantine. I usually go in there once a week to look at different like little props and accessories I can use. Yes. Um I I second that. And also uh we have a great flea market here. People move on the island and then move off and don't take a lot of their stuff and they bring a lot of things with them and a lot of them are really cool. So um, you know. Don't discount the the flea market or you know experience. Um, big box stores like uh, Home Goods, TJ Maxx, Marshalls. Their kitchen sections are always a mess, but they have little things that you can find to help with your props. And um, I like some of the glassware and the little things that I find at IKEA. I mean, they have some really, really, really cute stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those are, those are my recommendations. I mean, and one thing is, you know, if you already have, um, you know, everybody has plates and cups and bowls and all that, you know, but especially if you're an avid, it, you're, you cook regularly. Um, but, you know, buy a, a set you know, even if you're photographing the same set over and over, get a nice set of cutlery, you know, maybe, you know, two set, two, two place settings and, you know, cloth and cloth napkins and really interesting textured dish towels, things that you can add layering and texture to your images would 
you know, it, it draws the eye. Mm -hmm. What would you guys use for prophesy from like the utensils and the cutlery and bowls? What else would be a prop that you can get from these stores? Um, my favorite, yeah. some of my favorite pots are, I mean, props are actually like my pans. So I love a good cast iron pan shot, like a close up mm -hmm. shot. If you see a lot of my recipes, like or on Instagram or my website, I always do like the close up, like cast iron pan shot. Yeah. It reminds me of like a lot of um, of Bon Appetit's like photographs that they have on their website. So, um, what else did we mention? Did we mention drinkware is really important? Yeah. Too? Having having drinkware and um, and that brings me to another thing that you may encounter as as you get into this is you know Chanel and I talked about scale. You know when and we agreed that when we shoot our food, we like to eat it afterwards. There's no like, you know, motor oil or anything going in that's not edible. Um, so, you know, you look at a lot of other Instagrams and, you know, they're making these huge cakes and I'm wondering to myself, like, who's gonna eat all that? So, you know, think about also the, the size of your family or who you're actually serving. The food that you prepare doesn't have to be humongous. It doesn't have to be a huge portion. And so, you know, with my cast iron, I have a large one and I have like several like cute little ones. Oh, I need to invest in a small one. You know, when you are shooting a dish, um, photography in and of itself has a lot of optical illusions. And so somebody's automatically going to think that it's huge, even if it's not that big. Um, so it just it just depends on how you your the angle and how you shoot it. Yeah, that's true. Whenever you guys are ready to do um, for me to screen share, just let me know. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had some good pictures that we kind of talked about, but I sent you yeah. a picture of my setting, yeah. my setup. So it's so, actually by the window. Um, okay. So let me pull it up now. Um, now, do you want me to grab yours first? Sure. Okay. Um, all right, is that working? Oh, not yet. There we go. Wait. Okay, so. Okay, hold on. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so I want to show it without having to show all of my notes. <laughs> I'll figure that out. Um, we do have a question from Bethany. So, hey, ladies, do you have a specific style you prefer to shoot, lifestyle, editorial, or commercial? That's a good question. I think that um, a lot of my setups lean more towards lifestyle and editorial. Um, when I shoot, I want to... I want you to feel like it's something like that you're there and that I am, um, that you're being served or that you get to partake in this experience. So I guess um, lifestyle, but I mean, I think that they blend so much that you know, it just really depends. I mean, yeah, for me, I think um, I like mine to look kind of edit more editorial than anything. So. Yeah, I, I noticed that you have a lot of, um, Kiana, like you have a lot of the hands in your shot. And I love that because it, it does make you feel like you're there, part of like a gathering situation. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, did you get it? Uh, yeah, I think we're good. Right. So. So we can actually pull up the cast iron pan picture first. Okay, it's it's weird that. Sorry guys, bear with us. <laughs> we're getting hit. We're getting there. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. So I have to make it big first, and then 
All right, so the cap, the cast iron pan close up or far? Yeah, yeah. Close, up. close up, okay. Yeah, so I'll just comment on that first picture. Um, so this appears large, like we were talking about scale earlier, but this is actually like one of my smaller cast iron pans. <gasps> wow. uh, yeah, it's really small. So I actually made like, it probably serves four people at most, like a small portion of pasta from my cookbook, so. Yeah. Yeah, it appears big because I, the way I shot it, like really close up, but that is a small pan, so it's not a lot of food at all. And, and that's another, you know, one big tip that I would give somebody who is shooting food. If you're thinking that you're gonna put it on a dinner plate, you realize how much space you have to fill to make it look, you know, just like a, unless you're doing like a fine dining dish, um, you know, you have to fill a lot of space on a dinner plate. It is okay mm -hmm. to use a salad plate because when somebody's looking at it, they're they're gonna automatically assume it's a dinner plate, mm -hmm. but you know, it makes your dish look more full. It makes it look more vibrant. Wow, I'm learning so much. That's a, I never thought of doing that. Yeah, there's a, a image that I have on my Instagram that I posted for New Year's Day. And um, it's uh, pretty much a table filled with food and the dinner plates on you know the edge of the photo, they look like dinner plates, but they were actually salad plates because dinner plates would have completely overran the table. It would have just looked crazy. So, you know, scale is a big thing. You you'll find, especially if you don't have a lot of surface area to work in, your props, your dishes, they all need to be small. Smaller than you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, um Chanel, should I grab the next picture of the cast iron with the layout? Sure. So we can see the setup. So that, this is, um, so this cast iron pan is actually my large one, but um, I made paella, so it is a larger dish. But, um, so my setup is by my window in like near the kitchen. This is where I get the best natural light. Um, and my boards I actually made out of wood from Home Depot and I painted them. So I actually love painting my own backdrops because I can like make it look exactly how I wanted to make look. And um, yeah, that's what I did with that. I also have some more backdrops too, like that I've purchased from companies that are pre-made, but. Right. And I'm right not really liking making my own backdrops. I noticed that, is this the same backdrop? Yeah, that's the same backdrop. And there's a lot that you can do with plywood and plaster and some paint or stain. I mean, you can really get that kind of uh, stone type texture, concrete texture that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. This particular picture, um, I sent this because I'm actually using um, really hard direct light. So yeah, this was, a, this was different for me because I usually don't shoot in direct light at all, like, or I try to diffuse it, but it has a hard shadows and it was done for stylistic, stylistic purposes. So there's some different ways you can manipulate light to get um, different effects. Right. And one thing that I wanted to talk about for those watching is composition um, in terms of how you're going to set up your photographs or set up your food, you know, set up. And when you look at Chanel's image of these drinks, your eye leads you back through the entire photograph, which is what you want. You know what it is that... Um, you know what the subject is, it's the, the sensor drink, but you see that there's something happening in the foreground and there are things happening in the background. And so it gives you more information. It tells you a story about that particular um, beverage. Is so, there a certain dish that I should pull up from what you sent me? Uh, sure, you can um, pull up pull up the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Uh, the one without the grid, I guess. Okay.
So, you know, this image here, you know, as I'm setting it up, I'm putting my subject off to the left. And then I want to tell the story. I like to um, include all the, I like to try to include some of the main ingredients in my dish within the photograph. So, you know, you see that there's cheese, there's noodles, there's eggs. You know, I sourced this cookbook, which is one of my all time favorites. Um, <laughs> I love that cookbook. Yeah, it's like when that one falls apart, I just order another one because I mean, <laughs> my like favorite recipes in there. But anyway, um, but you know, you set you you're you're telling a story, and if you look from the cookbook, and your eye circles around, and it comes back, you know, to the pasta and the egg, it kind of like makes a swirl. And so you, as you're leading, you want to, you know, you want to direct the eye, whether it's going in a circle, half circle, creating triangles, having, you know, the props point to the main dish to create a triangle. Um, but you, you want to make sure that your eyes, the viewer's eyes being led around the entire image. Should I grab the grids? I'm really curious to know to know the purpose of the grids. Oh, okay. So um, I do. Um, let me pull it up. Um, okay. So this is pretty much um, the rule of thirds, and so on the grid you see that there the image has been divided into nine equal parts and the red dots are called crash points. Um, and so what you want, and this is something that I utilize in my wedding photography, product photography, um, and I would call it anchoring an image, but your subject should pretty much fall within two of the, the dots. Um, so, you know, it, instead of falling right in the middle of the image. And there are times and spaces and places where you wanna have your food right in the center. Um, but if you're telling the food story, you wanna make sure, like I said, that the, your eye is being led. You start down at the cookbook and then you look at the mac and cheese and then you see that there's all these other things. So it's a way of, of leading your eye and giving more, um, uh, visual effect, more drama, I guess. Someone is asking, we have a question for you from Nile or Nile. I'm sorry, I hope I said your name properly. She wants to know what the lens, which lens did you use for the macaroni and cheese posts? Um, I use, more than likely I use the 50, 50 millimeter. And I go between my 50 and um, my 100 millimeter, uh, depending on what I'm, I'm going, you know, what sort of effect I want. Um, and sometimes I'll use an 85, but it just, it really just depends. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hop over to another, another picture. Is there any specific one I should pull up? No. Um, I really like the one where you're holding the, the bowl. The soup? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, I don't know if there's any, uh, so that one there, yes. Um, so once again, if you, you know, the, you look at the subject, which is the soup, it falls into the lower two points if you were to pull up a grid. And, you know, that's where the subject is. Um, and then your eye goes around and sees that, you know, there's somebody there, there's, a, there's more to the story. How did you get the black back? Is, how did you get the black backdrop? So I have, um, Gosh, it's this, uh, where is it called? I think it's by Savage Paper, like uh, backdrop roll paper. I mean, it's really inexpensive and cheap. They sell it in multiple lengths. 
And um, I just cut off a piece and put it on the background because in my house, I have windows everywhere. It is so hard to get moody images um, without a lot of manipulation. And for that first question, that's where strobes come in because you can, you can manipulate that light really easily and not have to do a lot of extra work. Um, but I, it was a part of my um, aperture and shutter speed, my camera settings, and then having a black piece of paper in my backdrop. Mm -hmm. I love that picture. Thank yeah, you. I love it. Yeah. Did you have someone um, take it for you? Or you just have? No, okay, so this is um, the other thing. And uh, one of the things that I really in enjoy using, and it's, um, it's for the Canon users, Canon Connect. So <laughs> I don't have a lot of, I don't have an assistant. There's nobody helping me. So it sets up, it, if your camera has Wi-Fi, you can use Canon Connect to, um, to connect your camera via your uh, smartphone or iPad. And so you can see the image like, you know, as, as you, you're standing there set up. So a lot of times, like when you see me in a photo, it's, and I'm holding something with two hands, it's because my toe is busy on my, <laughs> I went like hitting the shutter because <laughs> like, I can see the image. I'm like looking down and I'm like, yeah, it looks good. Click, 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 click. <laughs> um, so, but you know, you, it's, it's helpful because you, you know, I don't have a screen that pops out on my camera. Um, and so I need to be able to see what I'm shooting. And so that, you know, just having the Wi-Fi and being able to connect helps mm -hmm. the process. And also it kind of, when you're, Face is on the the lens or on the the um, the back of the camera. You know, you you're so drawn in that you can kind of miss some things. So anyway, I find that like when you use a device or use an iPad or an iPhone, you see the image set up and you can manipulate it. You know, and like move things in real time before you click the shutter. One thing we didn't really touch on was like the camera angles and how to know, yeah, the best shot. Cause I know the macaroni you had straight up, up and down. And then I think Chanel for your seafood pot, it was slightly angled or was it just straight? That was just a, like a straight on shot. Yeah, overhead. So, um, there's pretty much three main angles that you'll see that work really well in food photography and that's the flat lay where it's the straight on you have and that's where you're shooting at you know 90 degrees and then um you have uh the 45 degree angle where is that's the viewer's perspective like when you are standing at a table and you're looking at a plate of food or an object that's the viewer's perspective and then you have just like the direct um you know angle where you you see a lot of hamburger ads and things that are supposed to be tall um you see that's that's another angle um and i i think it's important that you really look at what you're shooting um, if you're going to shoot a sandwich, you shouldn't do a flat lay, you know, unless you're going to have it open face and you're going to, you're able to see everything. Um, or if you're doing a flat lay, you, you know, I've seen some images where the burger is on its side so you can see all the layers. So you want to, you know, and if you're photographing something tall, it's probably better to do 45 or, you know, straight on. We have a question from Asia. She says she knows natural lighting is great, but is using LED lights okay to use? As a chef, she doesn't have windows in her kitchen. So would LED light be artificial lighting? Yeah, it's it's um, consistent light. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's completely fine. I mean, if you find that the LEDs that you're using don't have much diffusion and you're looking for that daylight look, then you would probably need to invest in a diffuser. 
Um, and depending on if you're shooting on the ground or if you're shooting on a table, you know, get a, um, a light stand with a clamp. They sell them that, you know, clamps to the diffuser and you can have your LED light and, you know, get, get those same effects. We have another question from Samantha. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations for mimicking the look of different lenses while using a cell phone to take food photos? She's currently saving for a professional camera and lens. Hmm. Um, what kind of what kind of camera do you have? Or what kind of phone do you have rather? Because I know with the iPhone, it takes it takes pretty good pictures, so that are pretty sharp and clear. So if you can get like Lightroom, Mobile, or Snapseed, as we spoke about earlier, just the editing. And as far and as your styling is on point, I think everything will be fine. You don't necessarily need like a professional camera to get that effect. Yeah. Well, um, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say. It's just an iPhone, so yeah, and iPhone have like, great cameras on them already. So yeah, if, yeah, there's a lot of elements to the picture besides like your camera. So just your styling, the lighting, all of that, and then your your post, you know, post editing. Mm -hmm. If all of that is together, then your picture will come out great. Right, and Lightroom Mobile, um, when you go into the app there is a little camera down at the bottom. You hit the camera and you can do, um, you can manipulate it so you can have a manual setup. Um, so that's really helpful because when you're shooting in Lightroom Mobile with your iPhone, it has the grids already. It has a level in it. So if you're like, you know, tilted too far or too over to the edge, it has a, a level and it kind of, the phone will vibrate a little bit when you're right on and your, you know, your phone is completely level, which is extremely helpful. Yeah, that's good to know. I've been using Lightroom for years and I had no idea. I've never shot on the actual app before. No, you should. It's actually um, kind of amazing. I've, uh, you know, I've shot a few images and I don't even have the iPhone 11. Um, I'm still on the late eight plus. Um, so even with Lightroom mobile, and then I go through and do, you know, my editing, uh, I love the, the image quality or what you can do. So we're almost at our hour mark. I do, I know, right? That went by so super fast. I want to cover um, how to go about getting getting your work featured, how to go about getting paid, like if I wanted to get into doing this full time. I'm not sure, if, yeah, basically full time, how to get paid for your work, how to get featured. So for me, um, I have an online portfolio and then I also have a media kit. So I will pitch myself to different food brands um, that I want to work with and I feel like we're a good fit. And then I'm also a part of some different photography hubs online. So there are websites where people or companies will come looking for food photography and you, they can look at your portfolio and you can kind of pitch yourself to them as well. And then also from social media, I get a lot of opportunities just by posting my content and people will find me, I think, via hashtags a lot. So I think those are very important as well. Like mm -hmm. SM found me through a hashtag. So so I think building your social media presence, having an online portfolio, and then initially being able to pitch yourself, that's been the route for me to actually get paid work. And Kiana, what would you say? I am still in the point where I'm in my building phase. Um, I can say that the opportunities that have come to me specifically for food photography have been organic or word of mouth and have been primarily local here on the island. Um, but I really do see myself going further and, um, and pitching. But uh, 
Chanel and I talked about this earlier this week and you know that's that's essentially that's really cool like that's essentially where um the key ingredient wants to get to so because at this point my work is inspirational so mm -hmm. <laughs> well we have we're almost at our hour mark is there anything that you want the audience these foodies who are listening to know any last tip and advice Yes, um, we are putting together, what do we call it, Chanel, a worksheet? Uh, oh. Yeah, a worksheet, a guide on getting started. So we'll cover, we came up with a list of suggestions and tips on beginning your food photography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's only so much that we cover in one hour. And, yeah. <laughs> right. and you know, there's a lot that we wanted to discuss that we'll discuss in the worksheet and you know it'll be filled with you know our personal tips and tricks and um resources as well uh for composition styling lighting um and all that good stuff <laughs> and then we're also doing the giveaway correct so yes how are we so <laughs> thank you to all of our sponsors Chanel from My Fabulous Foods is one of our lovely sponsors and you can explain what you're offering, but we're basically going to do a raffle tomorrow. I'll do a raffle video. So everyone who email RSVP, foodforfoodies at gmail.com. If you email RSVP, you're automatically able to be considered for, for what you're raffling off. Yeah, so I'm giving away two coaching sessions with me. So we can literally talk on the phone, we can talk on Zoom and go over what your needs are in regards to food photography. So you'll have time to ask me your specific questions uh, for tips, help with getting started, how to grow your business, that kind of thing. And yeah, we're gonna do two spots. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining. I wanna say, I wanna thank everyone who's in the audience. I wanna thank you two ladies for your time. I know I definitely learned a lot, especially when it comes to planning out. I was doing <laughs> completely <laughs> <good here. laughs> So everyone stay safe, stay, stay well. These videos will be up on the foodforfoodies.co website. They'll also be up on Facebook and YouTube so you can reference them. And then whoever RSVP'd, you guys received a newsletter with everyone's information on it. So feel free to reach out with any questions and stay tuned for more videos like this. Thank you so much, Absinia. We really appreciate it. This has been really, really fabulous. So thank, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I hope, I hope this was as informative to the audience members as it was for me. <laughs> Yes, but look forward to the worksheet because like we said, there's only so much that can get covered in an hour and any questions that weren't answered or, you know, we'll cover it in there and it'll be really informative. Definitely. So we'll send out the worksheet. We'll send out the raffle and then head over to foodforfoodies.co for, food, food for, for recipes and then follow us on Instagram. So stay safe, guys. Thank you. Thank you.